The root of the problem in the sustainability crisis is a loss of the sacred. Through conversations with scientists, theologians, scholars, thought leaders, and friends of the Spirituality and Sustainability Global Network, Make It Sacred explores the intersectionality of spirituality and sustainability and why this intersection is critical at our existential societal tipping point. Without spiritual grounding, we won't have a commitment or political will to create hope for sustainability. Co-creation always starts with a conversation. And what are we co-creating? A spiritually grounded passion that comes from a sacred understanding of the earth. Hi, my name is Maddie, and I'll be your host as we start these conversations together. everyone. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from Tom Plisk and Martha Keys, who are both collaborators in a project that you will soon learn a lot about called Fire in the Forest. They're both very interesting people who have done a lot of things in their lives, but I'm just going to briefly give an introduction about who they are. And if you'd like to read more about them, you can go to fireintheforest.org. I will put that link in the show notes. Let's start with Martha. Martha Keyes has worked for over 20 years in education as a teacher, counselor, multimedia person, and administrator, and she has experience teaching and working with secondary school all the way through university. She has also founded a nonprofit called Something in Common with a purpose to educate and present solutions to the public concerning the environment, clean water, housing, and public health. Due to the current situation in the Amazon, the Kennedy Keys signature game Fire in the Forest has now been significantly updated and republished for virtual and on-site presentations through Something in Common. You'll learn a lot about this in the episode to come. Martha Martha is a member of the North American Association of Environmental Educators and is a past board member of the North American Simulation and Gaming Association. Tom Plisk, for the past 50 years, has been a university professor, primarily at Florida International University in Miami. He's a founding member of FIU's Environmental Studies Program and has taught undergraduate environmental studies courses such as sustainability, deep ecology, energy resources, ecology of South Florida, and environmental education. Recently, he has taken an active role in global environmental issues and currently is an advisor to FIU's Global Indigenous Forum in the Spirituality and Sustainability Global Network. He was an invited presenter at the Assisi Spirituality and Sustainability Conferences in Italy in 2018 and 19, and his two recent books, Light, Truth, and Nature, and A Himalayan Hope and A Himalayan Promise, focus on exploring the role of humanity in global ecosystems from the viewpoints of major spiritual traditions, East, West, and Indigenous. In this conversation, we talk about Thomas and Martha's joint project, Fire in the Forest, which is a role play simulation that is based on ecological sustainability in the Amazon rainforest. It's really fascinating. And if you'd like to get access to this role play for your school, your work, your university, your place of worship, I'm going to put all of that information in the show notes. We also talk about it in great detail during the show, so you'll get to learn a lot about what it's like to experience the simulation and many other things. If you would like to support the Spirituality and Sustainability Global Network with more than just your ears, you can follow the link in our bio, and the URL is spirituality-sustainability.net, where you can donate to the SSGN to support further educational initiatives like this one. And you can also always leave a rating and review on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. It just really helps to spread the word and allow other people to hear these lessons and conversations with our inspiring guests. If you're listening to this episode when it comes out around the holidays, we hope you have a wonderful holiday with your family full of joy and peace. And let's get into this exciting conversation with Thomas and Martha. Let's start with each of you sharing with us what your cultural background is and who you are and what you do. Okay, Maddie. Well, I'll start off. I initially went into teaching uh, and then from teaching went into counseling. 
And from my counseling experience, I discovered the power of role plays in the, in the counseling interviews. And this was later brought to bear in terms of educational programs that I started developing with Moorhead Kennedy, who was a former hostage in Iran, a former diplomat, and who we linked up with after he came out of captivity. So he and I started our educational program, which was based around role plays. And the first one we actually did was called Hostage Crisis, which was based on his hostage experience, which, of course, as you can imagine, was a very powerful event. I decided to do a doctorate on it and did, uh, we presented it at Kane College in New Jersey. And we did, um, you know, control group, et cetera, the whole thing. And, And it was defined by statistics. And we took two words which were on fire at that time. We took the word American and we took the word Arab to see whether or not after going through the simulation that there was a change in attitude. And what we found statistically is that there was a change in attitude. In other words, people moved out of their extreme positions in terms of both cultural groups into a middle position which is the middle position of the bell-shaped curve. And I think educational people will understand that. And so we realized we had a transformational exercise on our hands. And from that experience, then, we developed other simulations. And uh, did I think we developed about 10 different simulations in a variety of topics. Now, the fire in the forest, which we've now recently developed for online and hybrid, et cetera, was started when we were sitting in our office in Manhattan and the sky became very dark. And the question was, what's going on? And we heard in the news that it was the fires from the Amazon. And that started the next simulation, which we call fire in the forest. And we developed that in paper format and then sold it through an organization we were with at the time called the American Forum for Global Education. And that went all over the country. And then that started our trip to Russia by invitation of educators there. And that was another experience. But maybe I'll stop here and let Tom pick it up to enter into the conversation. Okay, well... I'm a country boy. I was born in North Carolina, out in the boonies, near Chapel Hill. From a very early age, I really felt this very close connection with nature. My mother was admirer of St. Francis of Assisi, and so she taught me at a very early age that all life was sacred and that, you know, to have respect for it. And that stuck with me, and I found that came very naturally. I loved uh, being outdoors and became a butterfly enthusiast. When I was had any kind of difficulties in my life, I would always try to go out into some wild place, and I always felt calmed, and as if someone was listening to me, <laughs> and I always would come back, come back feeling happier. Then when I got in, I was lucky also, I got a very good naturalist teacher when I was in high school, and uh, taught me basically ecological principles before ecology was really known as a science. And uh, so I began to learn about connections in nature. When I was in college, I uh, ran into the Darwin's theory of evolution. And it, it struck me that we were, we were a part of a creation, you know, not in a biblical or religious sense, but something that had been going on since, you know, the, before time began. And that something was unfolding and that I was part of that and that nature was part of that. And it, it really it really just changed the way I saw myself. I saw myself as something moving in time and becoming something. Oh, I wasn't quite sure what that was, uh, but I had this feeling of a universal connection. I began practicing meditation when I was in graduate school. I was lucky I had I got some really good teachers that that helped me. So I've been practicing for 50 years every day. That's really kind of put everything together. I mean, it's basically 
took all of the pieces and things that weren't connected and, you know, gave me a sense of wholeness. And also uh, a sense that I needed to, to communicate with people about what I had discovered about myself in nature. And so I got into environmental studies at uh, FIU, which is where I still have a connection. And I was a co-founder of the environmental studies program there. We were able to teach from a multidisciplinary point of view. It was a wonderful program. Science plus some of the spiritual things that were going on, <clears throat> you know, the some of the religious and spiritual points of view that could come into it, as well as the the science and the you know the uh, environmental uh, biology part. So from there, I taught biology and ecology for a long time, and I would make our connection to nature as part of that focus of what I taught. Then I was uh, invited to teach a course in deep ecology, which is based on the Norwegian philosopher Arne Ness's work. And from there, I learned about Tom Berry. And from Tom Berry, I met Joe Holland and, and other people who are in the now in the spirituality and sustainability group. It's been a sense of expansion of my who I am and what I'm doing. And I feel a part of my mission is to, you know, communicate to other people the value of nature. And one of the things I used to do in my classes is ask people before they did anything. It was like on the first meeting, first thing, says, hi, I'm Dr. Tom Plisk. And so, so, so I'd like you to take a, a, an anonymous survey. I want to find out how you feel about nature. So write down, please, the five most important things you feel that you get from nature. Whatever it is, it can be anything. Nobody's going to know who wrote what. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if you do it, please be sincere and answer the question. So over the years, I got thousands of answers. Uh, probably about 80% of them were, you know, food, water, uh, materials, and so forth, the physical things. But the other 20 or 25% were what I called intangibles, things that were feelings or qualities that people identified in nature that they felt really were very valuable to them. And the top of the list were peace, or please, another way was freedom of stress. And the other one was beauty, the need for beauty. So some universal needs that we have in our life. So uh, I'd go through all of this, and for that class, I'd say, well, here's how we feel. This is These are the tangibles, here's the intangibles, and I'd present them to the class. I say, well, one of the things we need to talk about is how you, what you do, not just what you know, but what you do with what you know. Do we need less peace in our lives? Do we need less beauty? Do we need less uh, feeling of oneness, community, all these other things? So uh, that kind of set the tone for things. And then a number of years later, I, I met people who were connected to Tom Berry and was invited to participate in the first spirituality and sustainability conferences in Assisi in Italy. And they invited me to be a speaker and a group leader there. So I went. And that was that was great. I met a lot of people who felt like I did. And it was very nice. It was really nice to feel there was a community there. And so I've kept I've kept contact with all of these people and uh, and others besides. And then a few years ago, Martha called me up and said, how would you like to be work on a project. And I said, you tell me about it. And so she told me about Fire in the Forest. I was very intrigued by it because it looked like a way to get people to change the way they felt about things by identifying with other people. And the thing about the mind is it can be a barrier, <laughs> a really major one to any kind of progress, but it also can expand. And when it expands, it includes other people and other ideas. So uh, we tried out Fire in the Forest in my class. This was before it was electronic. Uh, it was just paper. But the students loved it. And they got a, really had a lot of fun with it. And it really, really had a lot of re responses from them. They loved it. They wanted to know what we could do next. So we ended up, we said, well, can we take on a local issue? And the issue of that of the day was the Everglades, which was being exploited in so many ways and damaged. And so they, they, we, the class really organized a community get together uh, or a se like a seminar on the Everglades and management. We got all the stakeholders and there are stakeholders in Fire in the Forest. We got indigenous people to come. 
We got the national park people to come. We got some of the developers to come, agricultural people, educators, and we had some dialogue. And uh, we didn't solve the, all the problems, but I think everybody came away understanding a lot more about what how the Everglades was intertwined in our lives than we did before. So uh, once they started working on this new version of Fire in the Forest, I said, yeah, let's do it. Because uh, I felt I, this, was, this is gonna help. If people can expand their points of view to include others, maybe they don't agree with them, but at least acknowledge that they're there, it's a way to find common ground. And from common ground, we can get somewhere. What do we have in common? We have earth in common. We have our need for peace, for beauty, and for a lot of other things in common. And so Martha had started this organization called Something in Common a long time ago. And, and I was happy to hear that Fire in the Forest was a part of Something in Common. I said, yes, that that's, sounds right, looks right, feels right. Let's do it. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Can you tell us what deep ecology is? I don't know what that is. Deep ecology is a actually a philosophy that includes as its major theme the integration of the human consciousness with that of the earth. And it was developed and stated as a philosophy by Arnie Ness, who died a few years ago, he was nearly 100 years old. He lived up on this mountain in Norway and everything, he, he lived a sustainable life. They used everything. And then everything that could be composted was composted. Everything that was uh, useful for anything was saved and used for whatever purpose they had. And they went to great lengths to preserve the fabric of the nature, which is kind of like an Arctic tundra in that part of Norway. And so people that visited him, I'd read some of their responses. People felt that they were an integral part of that ecosystem when they visited him. But he had definitely been in touch with uh, some of the Indian philosophers, Sri Aurobindo for one. And so he understood, you know, the, the deeper spiritual significance of humanity in the context of spiritual evolution. So he wanted to be a part of that and to really uh, give an alternative to just the science or just the social justice. He wanted to give a personal inner perspective. So um, I picked up on that and I, I used that as a title of course that explored that. What is our inner connection with nature? And how do we access it? How do we know about it? How do we develop it? And then how do we manifest it? So that's uh that's really <laughs> kind interesting. Of one thing to another. Yeah, and I think when you asked that question that you asked your students, what what are the things that you get from nature? The first thing that came to my mind was peace. Yeah. And it was interesting then when you said how 80% were were thinking about resources, and I didn't even think about that. But we all have different things, we have different ways that we relate to nature and we relate to ourselves as part of nature. And that's a fascinating question. You know, we're all connected on many levels. Yeah. From, from the, the vaster than the vastest one down to the minutia of everyday life. Yeah. And it's a, it's a question of, of, it's a question of consciousness. It's pure and simple. Martha, can you continue telling us a little bit more about Fire in the Forest and what it is and how it works, how it involves people, if they don't know what a simulation is or sort of an experiential learning tool <clears throat> like this. Well, as Tom suggested, people go into the simulation taking on various roles. In other words, they take the roles of the settlers and the government officials, environmentalists. We put in World News Network because we feel the media is an important aspect of this, indigenous people, intermediaries, such as a priest and anthropologist. And I think the key to this is that we've defined a role for the person to step into. We give them a, a, a face, a name, approximate age, a little bit about their philosophy, and then we let the person expand on that. But in taking on the personality, you have a person entering into the old Indian expression of walk in another man's shoes. So that allows the person to start off with a point of view about their problem. Now, the problem is a land mass that needs to be decided as to how it's going to be used. 
So all of these various groups are basically stakeholders in this. And then they have to work with the problem and the government gives them an ultimatum. And so there are three sessions and then they come to some kind of conclusion. Now we don't tell people what to say. We don't tell people what the conclusion is because it depends on the group of participants and how they formulate their their own position and how they work with to negotiate with other people who have entirely different intent. And so what you're doing is you're involving the intellect and you're involving the emotions. And that's the key to this, because once you get those two things merged and the person responding to both of those, then, then you're going to have basically a transformational experience. Now, we know that because we know that, as Tom suggested, how people come out of it. They come out of it in a variety of ways, depending upon their level of maturity and essentially what they need to know in terms of their own development. So we have people coming out of it talking about life skills, such as decision-making, negotiation. We have people coming out of it totally saying, the environment, let's do something about it. So you can see the variety of responses for it. And uh, it's just a very, very powerful event. We've gone back and talked with some people that have gone through it three years ago, and they still remember what, what the experience was and what they learned from. So we know that these things essentially, let's just say they stick. They stick in a long-term memory, and then they become part of how people operate. So I think I'll stop at that point. Did you, you had another part on your question? Yes, maybe, Tom, you want to speak to this. How does kind of putting yourself in the shoes of another person with different backgrounds, different convictions, why is that so transformational as opposed to just learning about something, <clears throat> reading a book or listening to a lecture or something like this? Well, I think that the fundamental thing is that, again, from a, from a spiritual point of view, we're all connected. We come from, we're like a family, a human family, and we share much more than we differ. So if someone can identify with another person to the level that they understand that these, that person's needs are also mine, because they see that is what they are experiencing, and that is the way they put their world together with these particular desires or needs. And to accept that as true for them, then we say, well, we all have things that we need. How can we find something that, where we can share something together? What can we have in common? How can we find some place where we can work together? So environmental movements are like that because people are figuring out we all share the earth. We all, are, we all live here, no matter, even if you're an atheist you, and you believe in science, science tells us, you know, the Big Bang and, you know, the creation of planets and stars and the sun and the earth. We can draw, we can draw a tree of connections from the beginning all the way to us. And so that's, that's interesting at an intellectual level, but it's also meaningful at an identity level about the identity means that's me. Or my identity is really much, much greater than myself. And it develops you know, the willingness to work together with other people and also a sense of humility. So I think these, these are the things that wake people up. Again, as Martha said, it depends what kind of experiences people bring to this from their own lives. But it is an opportunity for, for everybody to expand their notion of themselves, to include other ways of seeing things. And that's important. And if we can make that contagious, then people begin to listen to each other. They begin to say, okay, well, maybe we have helped can address this need, or maybe we can do things differently. So this isn't a problem for you. So hopefully when people do fire in the forest, they, they begin to ask these kinds of questions and seek these kinds of answers. What can we do together? Maybe what could we conceive that would eliminate some of the problems that we're causing by the way we do things? What do we need to change? And uh, how does that affect me? How does that affect you? How can we 
maybe find a solution for you know, working together. So all of these things are really important. And but it comes down to that connection that we have, which many people are unconscious of. And we need to to break that dome of encapsulation that people so that they feel and see other ways of doing things in a positive way. And that, uh, you know, Earth was, I, my, my view, intended to be a paradise. <laughs> we're, we're doing a lot of things that have done just the opposite. How do we, uh, how do we get back on track? Let me uh, just add to that. And that is, uh, a few years ago, they, they did a study. They wanted to break people's attitude about Africans and people from Africa. So they gave them a course in Africa on the continent, what was going on so forth. It was a book course. And people came out with the same opinions of Africans that they went into. They did a, a control study and an experimental study, and they came out with the same. In other words, there was no interaction. There was no experience. There was no, it was just intellect. And when you have the intellect, then people are going to stay in a fairly... They're fairly comfortable zone and come out with the same attitude that they went into the experience with. That's really interesting. And I think just as you have said so many times in this interview already, because it's so important and impactful is you really have to step into another person's shoes if you want to understand what their experiences, experience of life is like. It can't just come from a head place. It has to come from a head place and a heart place. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're doing with this. Even I've never done this simulation, but in college, I did similar simulations. And I still, to this day, like this was 10 years ago, almost, I remember them. And I learned more from those things than any lecture I ever attended. Not to say mm -hmm. that those aren't important, but it really is memorable and it sticks with you for a long time. So I can personally speak to that in my own life. On your website, you use the phrase, think global, act local many times. And can you just tell us what that means to you in relation to the simulation? Martha, go ahead with that one. Okay. <laughs> well, it's very interesting because earlier I was with an organization called Planetary Citizens, and that was what we were doing, trying to get people to think in a global way, but also take a action. And it's the whole thing about connectedness, as Tom mentioned, the connectedness with people uh, globally on all issues because we're part of humanity and this is this is the basis of, of life so that if we can have people think of global issues think globally and also take the action locally you know we're not going to solve global problems but we are going to solve our problems locally which are connected to the global you can't separate this. There is a direct connection between the local and the global. You want to think of the local as the earth and the global as a larger sphere, then that would be one way to consider it. But there's a deep connection and this experience allows them to think of the think of the global and also bring it down home and work on global, a local issue, whatever that local issue might be. You see, fire in the forest is about the environment. It's also about stakeholders and land. And this is a problem globally with all cultures, particularly with what's going on now with populations moving and so forth. And so you have various stakeholders, you have people moving and having to negotiate with people very different from themselves, very different culturally, very different points of view, extremely different. So it allows people to get into the power of negotiation and compromise in terms of all issues. So that's what we're trying to do on this simulation. That's another aspect of it. And some people pick up on it, some don't. That's okay. That, that's where they're coming from. But the the power of the stakeholder is definitely there. Can you also speak to the urgency of this matter and why this kind of education is really important? Well, it's crucial. I mean, we have a situation planet on the, on the planet where a number of these issues have to be resolved. 
and should be resolved quickly. And the UN has put out many guidelines on this, and there's been many conferences on it. Uh, but the, the the cycle that the Earth is on has to be recognized, and people have to have to deal with it. And I, I just saw something on the on the internet today how a whole see what country was that in? They were all oh I think it was Alaska. They were all moving. The whole town was moving, and had to. And then, of course, you have everything that's going on. And Indonesia had a recent earthquake, and they're on the what's called the Ring of Fire in the uh, along the Pacific around all the countries there, including New Zealand, et cetera. Mm-hmm. This whole situation has has to be has to be addressed, and it's it's very important. It's crucial now, and it's becoming more and more crucial that we recognize the, the pattern that the Earth cycle is on, and that we address the local issues that people are having to deal with. What are some of these local issues that people could take actionable steps on? Like someone perhaps that's listening to this interview, what are those things we can do locally that will impact us globally? Well, one of the things that we've identified as an educational objective with Fire in the Forest is to get people to think out in many ways about climate change. And climate change is something we're all involved in. So one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is about energy resources. It seems pretty clear from the science that uh, fossil fuels are a major factor, which is contributing to global climate change. But we have alternatives. We have solar, wind, geothermal, you know, uh, all kinds of other, other ways of producing energy which don't have the effects on global systems that fossil fuels do. So looking at your own lifestyle, what do I, and asking the question, what do I, what do I need in order to carry out my life as opposed to what do I want? You know, we all want more. And the idea is, and, you know, the earth charter people always say it's not a question of wanting more, but being more. And this would be to how can we live appropriately, live sustainably? And there's oh, so many things that have been discovered about this, how to sustainably farm. You know, here in South Florida, we have problems with water pollution. So I would tell my students, find ways to appreciate weeds in your lawn. Don't use weed killers and don't use fertilizers. You just get more bugs that way. And uh, that it cuts down on the water pollution, which cuts down on the red tides, which cuts down on uh, a lot of things. And, you know, try to uh, try to use transportation in such a way that you don't add to the carbon footprint. So it's kind of doing an audit of what you do and knowing something about the alternatives helps us feel that we're part of a solution to something in common, which we all need to solve, which is the, the climate crisis. And again, most people like wildlife. They may not admit it, they may be scared of bugs and snakes, but I said, you know, if you if you just stop spraying pesticides in your in your yard, you can do a lot. You, you'll find you're going to see a lot of wildlife you never knew was there before. So I do this at home. We, my, my wife and I are both, you know, gardener types. And uh, we we don't use, the first thing we did when we moved in our house was to get rid of the pesticide control people. And uh, so our lawn has 35 kinds of plants in it. But we also have, you know, three dozen butterflies that we, didn't have before because now they've got something to eat. <laughs> so we that fits in with our understanding of the web of life uh, and that there are responsible ways to do things and there are irresponsible ways to do things, even though we maybe think we're serving our own, our own needs. But we need to f- feel that these are more flexible and that there are alternate solutions. And as Martha was saying, the, the, the United Nations has been pointing this out for years, you know, sustainable development goals and you know, uh, all, a lot of other things that have been put out in the last 20 years saying this is the way the nation should go. These are all goals that we should share. In the Earth Charter, people have been saying the same thing. Sustainability and spirituality, people have been saying the same thing. So the more people that are, you know, being practical and say, yeah, we need to have a, a, a lifestyle that, that serves us, but also that takes into account what we know about the, the global family. So things we do, you know, in our backyard are very much part of the whole process of becoming globally aware. I think it's really interesting as you're speaking about that. Obviously, when you think 
a healthy planet equates to healthy people that are living on it. But on a really individual level, if you think about, okay, being a healthy person on an individual level, spraying pesticides in your home is not good for your health or driving everywhere in a car is not good for your health. So as you make those changes in your own life, it's also going to improve your quality of life. People might not realize that, but doing them slowly or changing their lifestyle a little bit is actually probably beneficial for their own health and well-being and happiness in the long run. Yeah. And again, it's the question of the awareness. Working with undergraduates here in South Florida, we find a lot of families that, that are basically teach their children to be afraid of nature. It's dirty, you know, dangerous. <laughs> there are snakes out there and, and other things, there are poisonous plants and so on. So a lot of it is to overcome these, I would say, very narrow ways of seeing environment. And uh, I think that, you know, the connection of so spirituality and sustainability, is, that's one of the things that's at the heart of it. So this, you have to accept nature for who she is, has certain qualities, some, most of which are very helpful and beautiful. Others are dangerous. You need to learn what they are and not get in the way. <laughs> if you run into a cobra, back up. If you're uh, swimming and you see an alligator, get out of the water. <laughs> basic kinds of things. Yeah, it doesn't mean we kill all of the snakes. No, it means we, we, we learn how to live with them. Yeah. You see, in order to have change, you have to have awareness. And this is critical in, in, in any respect that the person is going to change, but they have to have an awareness about the situation and awareness. It, it, it is predominantly the number one thing that people have to go through in order to change. They have to be aware. Martha, can you tell us a little bit if listeners are interested in doing the simulation themselves or bringing it to their school or workplace or place of worship, how they can do that? Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, we have a website, uh, which is uh, www.fireintheforest.org. And the first step would be is to people take a look at the website. It gives the outline of everything. It also has a lot of information about the team of us, Moorhead Kennedy, Tom, Diana Shannon, who designed the web. It's a beautiful design. And um, then they can go from there. They can order it. And uh, Tom and I stand by to be consultants to people in terms of any aspect that they have, any questions, any discussions. It's, it's a fairly reasonable amount of money. And if they want to order it for their institution, we can do institutional prices. But the looking at the website would be the first step. Then the other materials, including the manual, is about a 100-page manual with all the details involved with absolutely everything that we've gone through to help people with the simulation. But on the website initially, you'll have frequently asked questions and you get a feeling of the team behind it and we also included a beautiful video from Enya she did one on trees she's a uh, mistress of song and uh, we have video from the Amazon so we have a lot on the website for people to start off with and then my number is there if there's any questions about it at all they can call or write to me so that would be the first step Wonderful. Thank you. And I've watched that in your video. It was beautiful. Can you Thank both you. Yeah. share with us in your experience of guiding people through these simulations and working with so many different people over the years, something that gives you hope for this movement? Well, hope comes from an inner faculty we all have that sees that we can move forward, we can progress, we can have more peace. We can have more international uh, agreement. We can have community. We can have, express ourselves freely. And we see these expressions popping up everywhere. And the hope comes from, to me anyway, from, from recognizing that this is an essential part of being a human being, is that some part of us actually knows what real joy is, real happiness. And so 
when I see people getting happy because they do something that's done in a good consciousness or in a self-giving consciousness, it awakens and strengthens those feelings. So hope is, to me, an awakening of this, this capacity that we all have. And we all express it in different ways. We have different qualities and ways of becoming part of a global harmony. But to me, that's tremendous hope because I've seen this in people. I've seen it over the years. And as people change and they become, you know, they become wider and wiser and happier. So hope springs from something that's really true. It's not fantasy. It's something that's really true about us. I think part of our nature, our inner part of our nature, uh, knows that there is a, a more, shall I say, a more, uh, a happier aspect to our existence than we now express as a species. And we all know what those, that direction is. We just have to be brave enough to, to take it, recognize it, and take it. So, yeah, hope all the time. There's an old expression, hope springs eternal in the human heart. It's literally true. That's I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's such an, inner, such an inner quality. And we've seen it across cultures, across cultures, religions. I mean, it is something which which bypasses all the all the distractions you know of what we might label people and it really is there with the the inner being of the of the person and certainly we saw that when Moorhead and I toured Russia we had some incredible experiences over there with a wide variety of people wide variety we did one simulation with the KGB and we went into a whole environmental group and we just saw it repeatedly, 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 that you can get down to an inner aspect of the being when you are helping them to participate in something and you're being very sincere about it. You see, when we do this, we act as facilitators, which is what the teacher or instructor would be. They're facilitating the experience for the people and they make it a fun event. If it's not fun, no one's going to do it. But it is fun once people get engaged and they just start taking off on their role. And they have a great time. And we encourage people to try out different roles from their own uh, viewpoint. They may want to take a completely different opposite viewpoint to start off with. They may suddenly become a government official and they don't like government. It doesn't matter. You try it out. If you want to, you try it out. And so there's a tremendous amount of deep learning which comes from this. And it does tap in, as Tom said, to the inner aspect of the person. And it is very hopeful to see this, this actually blossom in front of you, which you can, as a facilitator, you can stand and watch it happen. And it does happen. So it's, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. And everyone, everyone enjoys it. People don't come out of these things crying or anything like that or despair. <laughs> they, they come out with a sense of purpose. So whether it's personal or whether it's guided by uh, what they're going to do next or how they're going to change or whatever, there is change that takes place. And that's why we call it a transformational experience because the change does happen. Well, thank you both so much for sharing about this. Now I want to do the simulation. Maybe we can do it somehow with the SSGN. <laughs> Is there anything that either of you want to say as we wrap up? Any last thoughts? It's okay if you don't have any. Well, one of the things that's been coming clearer and clearer to us is that global education is really important. You know, I've been trained as in sciences. And um, so some of the things we teach in science are of necessity global, like physical laws, chemical laws, and especially environment. And um, so we need to inject that into everything, that whether you're a mathematician or a business person or an accountant or a lawyer or a social worker. Uh, you're working in a global system and that, these are, that we serve a lot of very fundamental human needs. So I think it's, for us, we're looking for to spread this into the growing community of global educators. And at my university, Florida International University, we have a whole department <laughs> that specializes in global education. 
and studies abroad. That's another big part of it, going outside your own culture and your own your own place and going to someplace like totally different. Like we take students to Cambodia and Costa Rica and China, all kinds of places. So this is this is really important. I think that uh, simulation fits in with all of the global educational goals that, that we know about, which is, you know, getting this multicultural point of view, getting a, uh, you know, a global environmental perspective, getting a global economic perspective. These are all connected. And it, it all, it's, this is part of the, the hope that's there is that we're beginning to function as um, a, a global community. And that, that what, if the, when you go to the UN, there's a, sta- there's a sculpture there in, in the right as you, before you go in the main building, and it's kind of this metallic melange of objects and shapes. And I think the title of it is "And They Shall Beat Their Swords into Plowshares." So I'm thinking about instead of you know war, thinking about global agriculture. I mean that kind of thing. That's just totally different perspective of humanity. So global education is you know, where it's happening. So these are the people. Tom, wouldn't you, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, wouldn't, you say we're, wouldn't you say we're at a crossroads in terms of this, in terms of moving a humanity into a global education consciousness? Oh, yes. There's a lot of opposition. And uh, the old ways of me first and me strongest are still there. But, you know, where does that strength lie? I mean, if, if you conquer somebody, what have you got? You got a lot of enemies. So um, better to be uh, have a, a different perspective and uh, conquer people with your love and your mm-hmm. concern. So yes, these we re- we re- yeah we really appreciate this, Maddie. This conversation with you very much. Likewise, I learned a lot beforehand. I got to do a lot of research and hear about it, but it's really different and really impactful and wonderful. And essentially, I think this is what Fire in the Forest is doing, too. It's creating a conversation around these things, which is what we've just done. But I believe that's so important. And that's why we have this podcast with the SSGN, because we want to have conversations with all these different people and allow other people to hear these perspectives that we believe are so important and impactful at this time. So thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you.